So as I alluded to in class, a lot of companies will use FIFO or average cost methods for internal reporting purposes. So they'll keep all their records and their cost of goods sold estimates in those um, two systems. And then they'll switch over at the end of the period to LIFO because they want to use LIFO for tax. Now remember, the reason why they would do that is because they have to, if they use LIFO for tax purposes, then the LIFO conformity rule says they have to use LIFO for their financial reporting. So they don't really want to use LIFO because LIFO is troublesome to keep your books in, but it's not too bad if you just switch over to the end of the period. So when they switch over, they're going to have to make adjustments to their ending inventory and their cogs. So they will um, reap all the downsides of LIFO in terms of lower net income, inventory being expressed at outdated older prices. However, they will get the tax benefit and then they will also be able to keep their books in uh, FIFO or average weighted cost during the period. Why do they want to do that? A lot of things like executive compensation are um, based on gross margins and they feel that you know FIFO or average weighted cost is a more fair way to do it rather than LIFO. Um, and it's also an easier way to do it. LIFO cost systems typically are very expensive to keep track of and very data intensive. So what we use is an allowance to reduce inventory to LIFO account, which I will shorthand as LIFO reserve. The LIFO reserve is a real account that we continue to update and it's going to be contra to the inventory account. So if it's contra to the inventory account, that means that it is increased by a credit and decreased by a debit. So let's look at how it might work in, in, uh, in action here. Suppose a new company has Indian inventory $50,000 on a FIFO basis, but 40,000 on a LIFO basis. Now usually your Indian inventory is gonna go down because again, you're expressing LIFO at the older prices in terms of inventory. So what journal entry is required to put inventory on a LIFO basis. It's a new company and that's important because what we're saying then is that if it's new, it's LIFO reserve is currently at a zero balance. If we want to reduce it from 50 to 40,000, remember we want to then have a $10,000 balance in our LIFO reserve because the balance of this account will reduce my inventory account. <clears throat> inventory is currently being expressed FIFO well, in order to get it down to 40,000, we want to add 10,000 to the contra account, which means then we would have to credit this account. And the debit that's offset is just cost of goods sold. And that makes sense because if we are going to reduce my inventory, then I'm going to have to increase my cost of goods sold as the offset. But notice I don't have to change my inventory so I can continue counting for it on a FIFO basis. Suppose at the end of the next year, the Indian inventory is 55 on FIFO, 42 on LIFO. Now this is where you need to make, be sure to remember that the LIFO reserve is a real account. LIFO reserve would start at 10,000 because that's where we had it at at the end of last year. And in order to get it from 55,000 to 42, the difference between those, we want a $13,000 balance. Because then, if inventory were at a $55,000 balance, right, the contra account balance would reduce 55K to 42,000, which is what we want. Now, you gotta be careful because all you need to adjust for is $3,000. And that tells me how much I want to credit the life of reserve and debit cost of goods sold. So that's the adjusting entry I would make at the end of the period in order to put the inventory into LIFO. So let's look at this uh, question. A lot of people got this wrong when I field tested it as a multiple choice question. In 2010, we have the following items in, the, in a footnote. Using FIFO periodic, cost of goods sold was $22 billion, and Indian inventory was $2.1 billion. The balance in life for reserve account at the beginning of the year was a credit balance of $0.6 billion. By the end of the year, it had increased $2.8 billion. 
how much is ending inventory under a life LIFO cost assumption given the information. So we want ending inventory under LIFO. So what we need then is an inventory account balance and a LIFO reserve balance. Ending inventory was 2.1 billion. And the LIFO reserve was 0.8 billion. So quite simply, 1.3 billion because we would take the inventory and reduce it by 0.8 billion. Now, a lot of people messed it up by reading too much into it. They said, okay, it started at 0.6 billion, went up to 0.8 billion. Well, 2.2 billion must be the amount that I would want to alter my 2.1 billion by, so it's 1.9 billion or it's 2.3 billion. What is this 2 billion though? Right? This two billion is just going to be cost of goods sold, the adjustment I made in order to obtain the ending balance. So if I had asked you, for example, what was cost of goods sold under LIFO, well then you would take that 0.2 billion, add it to the 22 billion, and that would be the cost of goods sold under LIFO. Right? So that's the LIFO reserve, and that's how that works. Um, the, the next part of LIFO that we want to look at is liquidating layers. Now, layers, remember, only occur under LIFO. And this is where I likened it to the stale dog food building up at the bottom of my, my dog bin whenever I pour more bags of dog food in there, right? So we're going to look at how this, you know, occurs. At January 2012, we have... Um, oops, this is a typo in here. That should be February 2012. Anyway, in January 2012, we purchased 400 units at four and sell 250. So we don't quite sell out the entire January stock. So we have a layer of inventory in January. I then add a layer in February because I purchased 600 units at a new price and sell only 375. So again, I'm still left with the Indian inventory of 225 and 150 each at different price points. So now we have two layers. So as soon as this continues, I just keep building up stock because I never sell through everything I purchase. So I have a layer in May, a layer in April, a layer in March, a layer in February, and a layer in January. And then suddenly, you know, seasonal demand hits. Summer comes along and everyone wants to start buying this product that I have. Um, in June, purchases are made for 800 units at $9, but the sales amount to $975. So how would we do this then under LIFO system? Well, we would certainly sell through all 800 at June. So we would sell June inventory because that was our most recent purchases. Then after we sold all 800, we'd still have 175 units sold to account for. Well, then I'd start pulling them from the most recent layer first, sell off those 50, not enough, sell off those 100, not enough, and then sell off 25 of those so that there's only 50 now remaining in the March layer. So then it turns into this guy right here. So what happened there? We sold off May, April, and March purchases in, and June, but against June sales. So May purchases were matched to June sales, April purchases were matched to June sales, and March purchases were matched to June sales. Um, and this isn't necessarily appropriate because one of the whole reasons you use LIFO is to have a higher cost of goods sold um, and to report lower net income, lower taxes. Um, so again, our, our June sales are now being matched with, with stale prices. It increases gross profit in times of rising prices, and that's going to increase our tax expense. Um, when the LIFO liquidation is material, the firm has to disclose, remember disclose being the footnotes, it has to disclose the amount of the effect in the footnotes. Uh, in the above example, the way that they would do this is they would look at the effect of if all 975 units had been sold were $9 because $9 was what we purchased them for in June. So it takes the most recent purchase or price or the most recent price, 
and multiplies it by the unit sold. Well, if all 975 had been had come from our most recent price, that would be eight thousand seven hundred seventy-five dollars of cogs, right? Versus what we liquidated, which was eight hundred at nine, fifty at eight, hundred at seven, and twenty-five at six, which is the cogs with liquidation. So essentially, you calculate a cogs without any liquidation and then a COGS that happened with liquidation. And so in this case then, um, COGS would have been 370, uh, is $375 lower, increasing tax expense by $150. Um, so that's pre-tax, and so then that would be post-tax, right? Um, no, not pre-tax, post-tax, but this would be pre-tax, and this would be the amount of tax expense we're paying extra because of that effect. So how do we deal with this? Um, traditional LIFO is very problematic with LIFO liquidations. LIFO liquidations occur frequently, and traditional LIFO is um, where we have, I use the example of a grocery store, uh, 20, you know, uh, a pool of LIFO for lettuce. And then we have a LIFO pool for potatoes, and then a LIFO pool for carrots, and then a LIFO pool for avocado, et cetera, et cetera, right? Every single item has its own LIFO system. And so if there is a run on any one particular item, then we're going to be liquidating layers very quickly. Okay? So one of the things they thought to do to combat this idea was to use what we call specific goods pooled LIFO. Specific goods pooled LIFO said, all right, let's throw all the vegetables in one you know, LIFO layer. Let's throw all, the, well, maybe just all the produce and then all the meat and dairy in another and then all the canned goods in another. And so we started combining those items so that if there was a run on lettuce, well, you still had other produce items that you recently purchased that wouldn't allow you to erode a whole layer of current prices without a serious run on the produce section, right? Um, and so there are some problems with this approach, namely that um, there, was a, there was stores that would redefine their pools rather frequently. They would put an item in one pool, and then if they had a new product, they'd have to switch pools or put it in a different pool. And so it became a little bit odd. Um, and it just really wasn't all that helpful because what companies started doing was just putting even unlike items in the same pool. So they put, you know, tofu with meat and vegetables all together because they were all fresh food. Maybe uh, most firms only only had or even retail firms only had two or three pools of inventory. And that's just kind of ridiculous knowing the uh, sort of varied goods that are sold at any of these stores. Well, eventually we came to dollar value LIFO. So not a lot of people use this anymore. A lot of companies will use what we call dollar value LIFO. The nice thing about dollar li value LIFO is that it creates a single pool of inventory for all goods in the corporation. So there's no you know, lettuce here, carrots here, potatoes here, or there's no produce and then meat and dairy. It's just all one inventory. Um, no problems with redefining pools. Because everything's in one layer, it becomes extremely hard to liquidate a layer because you would have to uh, sell through all of your period's purchases. Uh, changes in the pool are no longer measured in units like we have been doing where we said well we sold 130 well we want to go lifo so we take 30 from this layer and 20 from the next and 80 from the next we don't do units anymore we now do total dollar value as our indication of whether or not we burn through a layer uh, it requires the periodic method of accounting to determine cost of goods sold otherwise you don't have an idea of what you bought and what you sold the whole idea of using or the dollar value methodology is to look at your ending inventory in one year compare it to your beginning inventory in the prior year and then determine if there was an increase or a decrease and if there is an increase then any any amount of increase is assumed to have been purchased this period right um, so that brings me to the dollar value life of speech and I'm trying to figure it's a pretty, it's a pretty intense method. Um, so, 
we walk into a warehouse, right? So this is a step-by-step -step narrative and it's very necessary because otherwise you don't know what the hell you're doing and this is a very complex process. So you walk into your warehouse and you have goods from all different dates, right? You don't know when you purchased them. So you don't assume anything about when we bought them. All we say, I mean, we don't assume that we bought certain ones in one period and certain ones in a different period. We just assume that we purchased them all at this year's prices all in this year at this year's prices, okay? So assume that we have $1,275,000 of inventory at December 31st, 2016, and this amount was calculated using 2016 prices, right? So we have a general idea of how much the price of goods has increased relative to last year, not the amount of goods that we have in our inventory, but just the price. So we have an idea of inflation on purchases. In order to determine whether our inventory level has increased or decreased relative to last year, we're going to use a price index which adjusts for the inflation to translate all of the inventory we currently hold at this year's prices to inventory we hold in the prior year's prices. So we're going to go from $2016 to $2015 using this amount. So let's assume then that we have a price index of 102 in 2016 versus 100 in 2015. That means that prices in general are about 2% higher in 2016 than they were in 2015. Then in order to convert this amount, which remember was the ending inventory in 2016, in 2016 dollars to 2015 dollars, we're gonna divide by 102%. So we take 1,275, sorry for that weird two, $25,000 divided by 1.02, and that would give me $1,250,000. This would be my 1231.16 ending inventory, in 2015 dollars. So now that we have that 1231.16 in 2015 prices, we can compare that ending inventory to what we had on 1231.15. Right? So assume that on January 1st, 2016, which is the same date essentially, we had $1,125,000 of inventory in 2015 prices. So we would compare the two, right? One, two, five, zero million, that's at 12, 16, 12, 31, 16. And then we had 1,125,000, and that was at 12, 31, 15. So then we must have had an inventory increase of $125,000. And that, again, is in $2015. Why is it in $2015? Well, because we just converted $2016 to $2015 so that we can compare it to the other ending inventory in $2015 to get a real price increase, or not a real price increase, a real purchase increase of in $2015. You can only add and subtract amounts if they are in the same currency. Right? Can't subtract $2016 from $2015 because there's been inflation, and that doesn't work. So this is in 2015 dollars. If this is the amount of inventory rose over the year, well, these are our 2016 purchases. But they're in the wrong currency. They're in 2015 dollars. So we need to convert them back to 2016. We multiply by that same scalar that we divided by in order to scale them into a 2016 pricing purchase. Okay. I keep saying price, and that's not. 2016 purchases in $2016. So after we determine this, we would now have two layers of inventory. One at 2015. That 2015 layer would be everything that I started with, because that's just the base year. Okay, It's going to be a little different than all the other years, just because it's your base amount. 
And it's not always going to be that big. It just, I designed it to be that big. Now, we added a layer of inventory. That was in 2015. We added a layer of inventory in 2016, and that layer was the purchases that remain. So why did this work, right? Um, it worked because we had one ending inventory, we had another ending inventory. We assumed that anything we didn't sell over and above what we had last year was all purchased in 2016. Why would we assume that? Because we're doing last and first out. So I would have sold through all my 2016 purchases, but since I still had more inventory at the end of 2016, that must have meant that the layer was formed because purchases exceeded sales for the year. Anytime purchases exceed sales, we're going to create a new layer. And then if at any point sales exceed purchases, we will not have a layer for that year. And we'll have to probably scoop out some inventory from the year prior. So here's a step-by-step -step way to approach it. I am going to go through this and use it as a problem to get you used to the method. I will follow these steps and I will talk you through it. All right. So assume we established 2015 as our base year. On 12-31-16, we walked into the warehouse and determined that we purchased, if we assumed we purchased all the inventory in 2016, we'd have inventory at a cost of $111,300. So this is our base year. This is where we started at. This is my estimation of ending inventory that's left in the warehouse if I assume everything was purchased in 2016 dollars. Okay. So the first thing I would need to do in order to compute ending inventory and dollar value LIFO is to take the 111,300 and divide it by the price index to turn it into 2015 dollars. So I have 111, 0.3 divided by 1.05, and that's giving me $106,000. So this is 1231.16 in $2015. I can now make a direct comparison because that's in $2015, and the base here is as well. So this was 1231.15 inventory in $2015. And so I had a real inventory increase. In $2015. I'd say I call it real because we've adjusted for inflation. Now, this increase means that I purchased some things during 2016, I sold some things during 2016, and I still had $26,000 of inventory at $2015. So to determine how much I had as an increase in $2016, I multiply it by the price index in order to convert it back. So I have 26,000 times 1.05, and that becomes 27,300. This is my increase in inventory in 2016 dollars. All right, so now this becomes a layer. I have a layer that I added in 2016 because this is what I had left over after I accounted for all my sales. And then I still have the layer from 2015. Now, how does this give me ending inventory? Well, under a dollar value LIFO uh, methodology, ending inventory is the sum of the layers 
each expressed at their own year's prices. This is in 2015 dollars, this is in 2016 dollars. I add the two together to get ending inventory on the balance sheet. Right. So now we keep going with this process. These are my layers going forward. I look at 2017. I walk into the warehouse in 2017. If I assume I purchased everything in 2017, my total inventory would be at $108,000. And 2017 has a price index of 120. That was some rampant freaking inflation, right? So 108 divided by 1.2 is gonna give me 90,000. This is my 1231.17 inventory in 2015 dollars. All right, now I need to compare that against last year's ending inventory in 2015 dollars. Well, what was last year's ending inventory in 2015 dollars? If you label your work well, you can tell you have it right here. Okay, it was just last year's inventory prices all expressed at twenty-sixteen dollars divided by the price index, so that I converted it to base year dollars. So one hundred six thousand was that inventory expressed in twenty-fifteen dollars. Now I have them in like currency. Well, this time I have a $16,000 decrease in 2015 dollars. All right, so I have a decrease. That means that my sales exceeded 2017 purchases. So I bought some inventory in 2017, but it wasn't enough to keep up with sales because I dipped into my inventory from the prior year, right? It went below that mark. It went $16,000 below that mark in 2015 dollars. So not only did I get rid of everything I purchased in 2017, I also sold off some inventory in this layer, right? This, or, or that's, that's in this 106,000 one of these layers. Well, which layer do I want to take? It's LIFO, so I want to take the most recent year's inventory, 2016. Right? I want to take it away from 2016, but can I subtract 16,000 from 27,300? No. 27,300 is inventory in 2016 dollars. Convert it back, in 2015 dollars it was 26,000. So I want to take 16,000 from 26,000 That means I have $10,000 remaining in the 2016 layer. Now this is in which dollars? 2015 dollars. It's in 2015 dollars. It needs to be in 2016 dollars. This is where people will screw this up. They'll take this and convert it into 2017 dollars. No, no, right? 2017 purchases are all gone. There's no layer for them. So this is gonna be 2016 dollars we want this in. So then we have to multiply it again by that 1.05 price index, which would make one layer of 10,500 and one base layer still expressed at $2015 as 80,000. So I had a real inventory decrease. I took it from, well first I sold off everything in 2017 if I had a decrease, right? If I didn't, I'd have had an increase. If my purchases in 2017 exceeded sales, I'd have had an increase. But since I had a decrease, I sold everything in 2017 and I sold extra. Where do I take the extra from? The 2016 layer. Well, if it's 16,000 excess that I wanna take away from 2016, then I'm having this in 2015 dollars, I have to convert this back into 2015 dollars 
26,000, subtract off the 16,000, 10,000, but this is in 2015 dollars. Uh, since this layer that I'm manipulating here was the 2016 layer, I want to multiply it by the 2016 price index to get the 2016 layer. Very step oriented, very complicated. You're gonna to have to do a lot of problems on this to make, have it make sense. Now again, these are both in their own dollars, in their own year's dollars, 2016 dollars, 2015 dollars. Now I have 90,500 for my ending inventory at 12.31.17. One more. On uh, 12 December 31st, 2018, we walk into the warehouse again. We see this much inventory. We note that the price index, again, we're in rampant inflation. So the price index is 130. In order to get that 2018 inventory into $2015, we're going to take 128.7 and divide it by 1.3, and we get 99. So 99,000 is the 1231. 18 inventory in 2015 dollars. Um, <clears throat> again, we need to compare it against what happened last year, 123117. And because we want them in like dollars, we want that amount in 2015 dollars, and that would be 90,000. So we had an inventory increase this year in $2015. We want to convert this into $2018 because this happened. Purchases exceeded sales, so we built up inventory. This is going to be at 2018 prices. If we multiply it by 1.3 to get it into $2018, which is 11,700. Now we have an inventory layer of eleven thousand seven hundred in twenty eighteen dollars, an inventory layer from the prior year of ten thousand five hundred, just building off of this layer here, twenty sixteen dollars and eighty thousand in twenty fifteen dollars. Add all these guys up: ninety thousand five hundred plus eleven thousand seven hundred is 102,200. This was what I would express ending inventory on the balance sheet at, at 123118. All right, so that's dollar value LIFO. Make sure you work a lot of problems with it and get this process down. Understand, talk yourself through it. Otherwise, it's not gonna make a lot of sense. Okay? I'll pick up there with lower cost or market and we will explore that topic.